Kevin Revier, and uh, he's going to be speaking on the topic of surviving with spirituality and analysis of Scientology in a neoliberal modern world. And as I mentioned earlier, Kevin's paper is the award-winning uh, paper this year for the Carolyn Rose undergraduate paper competition. Uh, so, all right. Um, Karl Marx states that the capitalist market must extend its grasp to every corner of the world. And really, throughout my research, I realized that the spiritual world is no exception to that. Um, throughout the last 20th century, there's been a huge growth in new religious movements, and generally they do produce and sell spirituality to consumers. And uh, I found that from 1900 to 1990, 800 million new religious movements emerged in the United States alone. And uh, the Church of Scientology is one of them. Actually, in 1949, the um, founder of Scientology, L. Ron Hubbard, stated if a man really wants to make $1 million, the best way would be to start his own religion. And uh, he did this in 1954 when he founded the Church of Scientology, and by his death in 1986, the church became a $400 million empire, and it's still growing today. Uh, so I really wanted to look at how an organization could profit off of selling spirituality. So I looked at how the member joins the church, how they consume in the church, how the interactions between them kind of give value to the items that they're consuming, and how this has influenced the church to mobilize into the uh, public arena. So I really like doing this research a lot because it allowed me to really go into the field because I used a qualitative ethnographic approach. So I went to four visits to the Church of Scientology in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, and I directed five interviews. And I um, interviewed a service leader, um, and an auditor, a course director, a receptionist, and a new Scientology member. So I kind of hit all different levels in the organization. And then I looked at their motivations to partake in the group, um, what they've gained from the experience, and most of the information I found was from informal conversations, like during a lunch break or um, like during one of their cigarette breaks. I just kind of talked to them and just kind of see how their worldview is kind of constructed. And then I also participated in two auditing sessions, received a personality test, and attended two church services. And I found that really to enter the church, it's important that you kind of believe or embody the Thetan. And uh, that's kind of the Scientology spirit, and Hubbard describes it as the cloak over the mind and the body. And it really incorporates every aspect of the individual's life, and he looks at eight different dynamics. Uh, the self, creativity, group survival, species, life forms, physical universe, uh, spiritual dynamic, and infinity. And I looked at how the individualization process helps kind of keep the, regulate the member in the church. This, uh, Foucault calls this the principle of elementary location where each member is individualized and has a particular portfolio that the, can be regulated. And all the way from Taylor, Frederick Taylor Scientific Management, uh, they advocated that each factory has a labor office that can regulate all of those. And uh, so I looked at, and actually the church has an office where only one minister was allowed to, ask, to assess the member's spiritual portfolios and kind of guide their spiritual um, development in the church. And uh, the individual spirit is realized uh, first and foremost through a personality test. Uh, these are free for members to, or for latent members to use, and they operationalize and individualize the spirit. And uh, they're based on multiple choice questions and require the individual to answer with a yes, no, or I don't, yes, no, or I don't know response. And uh, it just contained, it contained actually 200 different questions, and questions like, do others push you around, or are you a depressed person? And really, they aim to find deficiencies in the personality, and it's not a really credible test, and they actually found that I'm nervous, uh, irresponsible, <laughs> critical, and that I have a lack of accord, so I'd like to believe some of those might be kind of true, but not completely true about my personality. And what about uh, the professor that you're angry at? Oh, that I'm okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, it really determines how much the person needs to work with the church to be able to overcome those deficiencies. And then there's the E-meter, and that's uh, basically that's two metal cylinders and then a gauge. And then the auditor asks them questions or brings up topics, and then if the gauge goes up, and it has the, then it kind of reveals how much tension is in the person. And uh, David, um, a course trainer, claimed that the meter is supposed to find things that members aren't even aware of. And then uh, Lindsay, in, um, a service leader, had me actually hooked up to one. And uh, she just brought up random questions like relationships and things like that. And the gauge always showed uh, tension. And uh, one of them was, she brought up a prof she just said something about professors. And I really didn't have any, uh, anyone in mind that I could think of that brought me tension. But I did think of one that classmates have, aren't really, uh, classmates don't really like, and it, it wasn't Steve, so. <laughs> and, uh, That's what he said. Yeah. 
But after they individualize and individualize and operationalize a person's personality or spiritual spirituality and reveal those deficiencies, they claim that they can overcome these deficiencies by really working with the church. Um, and L. Ron Hubbard stated that the ultimate existence is to become a clear, um, and that's the ultimate state where you, you can. Pro he claims you can process data like a computer machine and have high IQ, memory, and skills in any endeavor. So really, to be able to overcome all those. And they use celebrities as models to excel towards that, like John Travolta, Kelly Preston, Tom Cruise, Katie Holmes, and Kirstie Alley. And I don't really personally wouldn't want to be like any of them that much. But <laughs> it's kind of models that they can kind of ideal selves that they can that members can try to strive for. And then um, I use some psychology principles or theory to examine how this process works. And I looked at um, Alfred Adler. He states that when an organism is deemed inferior, they seek to dominate their environment. So they the inferiority comes from the e-meter personality test, and then they are able to imagine higher levels of being and excel towards it to overcome those deficiencies. And then, to overcome them, they have to consume in the church. And this really follows the neoliberalism patterns, the idea that the free market is the only option for citizens to gain a well-being at the expense of social support. Now, a lot of proponents for neoliberalism state that it can bring democracy, human dignity, and freedom. Um, however, as Thomas Lemke points out, it really produces competitive behavior of economic rational individuals because it compels them to take on responsibility for social risks such as illness, unemployment, and poverty. But in this world, the neoliberal world, spirituality has really become a hot commodity because it allows um, people to advance or gain self-care through individual personal and productive growth rather than having the strict religious orthodoxy. And uh, Weber states that modernization has caused the disenchantment of the world. So arguably, the neoliberal ideology creates the rationality for entrepreneurs to really re-enchant the world with their own kind of idea of spirituality to be able to sell it on the market. And um, Hubbard really did follow this trend. In fact, the church states Scientology's beliefs lie in the deepest roots of all great religions. And his online biography outlines his expeditions to countries in Asia, his work as a psychoanalyst during a boat expedition, and his ability to understand physics as a civil engineer major at George Washington State University. And it claims that he was a man who spent a quarter of a century bridging the gap between the East and West science and religion. But really, he just took various cultures and ideas from other belief systems, operationalized them, and then sold it on the market. And then one way that they sell these is during auditing sessions. And basically, during an auditing session, the member and an auditor sit in a tiny room. And then the member just kind of repeats past experience that they have. And then the auditor asks them to pull out engrams or negative triggers that may be in that experience. And this allegedly places these memories into the rational part of the brain, so then the member can overcome them and then think completely rationally like a computer machine. And um, for example, I did that with uh, Craig audited me, and I did two sessions, and they were both two hours long. So it was a long process. And basically, I just recalled memories, random memories that I kind of remembered. Of course, memory recall doesn't work like that, but that's where the spirituality component comes in. But, uh, I, and he just kept having me repeat it over and over and over again for like two hours. So it was kind of mind numbing. But, uh, and then they also have training courses, and these include courses ranging from marriage, raising children, and trusting people. And again, it's really because they're ab the Thetan encompasses all aspects of life. So it's able, they're able to have training courses on everything. And uh, David showed me one on marriage. He told me that this course was used to help newlyweds, and he said, when that goes to shit, there's a course on how to rebuild your marriage, and then finally a course on how to uh, maintain a positive relationship. And really, I mean, I question the credibility of the first one if one, subsequent ones were automatically needed. And um, it is a pretty expensive, some of them are pretty expensive. The ones that you can kind of buy online, and um, DVDs are just 15 to $20, but members have paid up to $300 per hour. And according to Time Magazine, followers have paid up to $40,000 for courses and auditing sessions, which is a tremendous amount of money. And even achieving the level of clear alone amounts to at least over $120,000, so a lot more than most even college educations, clearly. And um, during an interview with David, he pulled out a diagram that, called, that was called the Bridge to Total Freedom. And uh, he pointed out all the traits that someone can gain by climbing up the bridge and taking these auditing sessions and training courses. And you, it claims that you, let, you gain the ability to communicate freely with any, um, on any subject with anyone. Uh, relief from hostilities, from sufferings, from life, and the ability to handle with handle anyone with communication alone. So it's pretty big claims that they're making. And I've found out that the 
validity of the rituals and items to produce these actual effects, of course, isn't scientifically valid, but it's recognized through the social interactions between the members. Through the social interactions, they create and develop norms that are linked to the status that each member has in the group. Um, and an informal lunch really shows how this happens. Um, I had a lunch uh, with David, Craig, and Hannah. And uh, as we waited for our food, I asked Hannah how long she had been, been auditing. And she said only for a month and a half. And then Craig immediately said that she was looking better already. And um, <laughs> David agreed. And then eventually Hannah noticed that I was missing my napkin. And in response, Craig said that he saw the waitress accidentally grab it and forgot to replace it. And he also said that he smiled and then said that he had been off, or doing training courses for observation skills. So it must have been linked to that. And then uh, you can see how the status hier hierarchy develops just by being a part of the organization. Um, Hannah already was looking better. Uh, Craig pointed out his observation skills, but Hannah noticed my napkin was missing too, but she wouldn't have been able to attribute Scientology for that. And then Craig also discussed um, Bob, who was a higher level, and then he, uh, and he's, or actually he's the highest level, and um, he was talking about how successful he was, and he's this huge, great business, business guy, and um, you can see how that's more linked to um, just his success in life that allowed him to basically pay or be able to commit to that. And really to maintain the legitimacy of the beliefs and rituals through the social interactions, the church has to mobilize in the public arena. Uh, and they've developed themselves by framing themselves against social conditions that they deem are negative. And uh, this has developed a campaign to clear the world. Um, during an interview, David asked me, wouldn't it be cool if everyone in the world was a clear? And I didn't really know how to respond. I didn't want to. I think it sounds terrifying and impossible, but they're determined to spread that social movement with moral claims to save the world from war and crime. And they've actually had a lot of um, organizational development off of that, like they have Narconon, a Scientology-based drug purification center. Um, and David discussed a sauna that's going to be in the new church that actually sweats out um, negative effects of drugs in the past, um, spiritually. And then Criminon, an organization that applies Scientology's techniques to reform criminals. The World Literacy Crusade, which focuses on study techniques for children, looks at how engrams can develop from not reading certain uh, words correctly. And Applied Schol Scholastics, which focuses on teacher training programs. And they really mobilize with an immense amount of wealth from members. So they actually really do um, get into the public arena. And uh, I went to a fundraiser at the Science Museum, the Minnesota Science Museum, that portrays how the church appeals to members to gain this funding. Um, the fundraiser looked at, or was aimed at establishing an ideal organization in St. Paul, Minnesota. And the organizer expressed how great it would be if the CEOs would get on the bridge. And she explained that the church was important not only for the members' children, but for their children, or for their children when the members are their children, because of, they believe in past lives that also need to be audited and that also come. So, um, and then another speaker declared that, ra or future lives too, and, and uh, reincarnation. And another speaker declared that raising the money was imperative for the creation of a new civilization that would better mankind from the bottom up. And uh, eventually a kind of auctioneer Scientologist entered the stage to raise money and he just really tried to work up the group and tried to get them to jump statuses. And uh, there's kind of a status uh, bridge and it ranged from friends at under $500 to platinum humanitarians at $750,000, so it's a lot of money. And uh, many of the members were actually at the $100,000 humanitarian level. And, they, and he claimed that this would extend their third dynamic, their group survival dynamic. And if it extended their third dynamic, then it would extend to all areas of their life. And so he even asked, do you want to wake up with a raise tomorrow? And uh, two of the members actually gave $100,000, and uh, many gave $10,000. So by the end of the night at 12 AM, they raised over $570,000 in about three hours. And then this left um, a little over $800,000 needed for the new church. So they were really nice. The members were really nice people. They thought that they were kind of investing and in giving and then also investing in themselves. Um, but their frame for social justice was really connected to that ideal spiritual world based on the neoliberal market principles. And they really, and that of course, any market, free market doesn't promote social, ecological, and human justice. So as my research shows, the church gains a tremendous amount of wealth from its members and this involves recruiting members from pointing out their deficiencies and also operationalizing their individual personality. And once they enter the church, they consume in the church by, um, in that neoliberal self-care ethos or way. And then the value of the beliefs are recognized through social interactions. And then this has influenced the church to mobilize its ideology into the public arena with the help of members' donations. Uh, so this really has promoted free market spiritualism as a way to heal social problems around the world. And it's distorted members' understanding of the world and has caused them to actually promote the destructive neoliberal system. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Kevin's paper just makes me uh, a bit awed by some of the things my students will put themselves through in order to get <laughs> uh, But anyways, these all three papers are, uh, for me as an educator, very inspiring uh, and also very uh, motivational. They keep you wanting to do this kind of work that we do at, at St. Cloud State. Um, so I thank them for uh, bringing their papers and presenting them to the, to the public. And now I'd like to introduce uh, Dominic.